Okay, lecture six, we're going to do Fourier optics. And so a lot of you have been wondering, what the heck is Fourier optics? Because you've heard of the Fourier transform, and what the heck does that have to do with Fourier, with, with optics, that is? Well, by the end of the day today, you'll be able to understand, for example, image compression using Fourier transform, and then, of course, understand how it applies to optics. And so look at this image here. When you think of the Fourier transform, you think of harmonics and space and frequencies that an object or something is broken up into. Look at this image. There's all sorts of harmonics you can see here, such as the waves in the background and the clouds and things like that. And so we'll talk a little bit later about, you know, how you can use Fourier transform to represent this image not as exact bits, but using compression in terms of its harmonics. And then we'll talk, of course, about how you can apply that to optics. I got one more image for you, too, which is a little bit more humorous, uh, but that's a good segue into today because I think this week is the most real and maybe fun that the Fourier transform will ever be for you, okay? Unless you really like mathematics. If you really like mathematics, you might, this might not be as fun, but it's going to be tough to make the Fourier, more, Fourier transform more tangible than you're going to see this week. So today we're going to use a bit of ray and waved optics, but it's going to be far more complex than that and hard to visualize. We'll need to rely on mathematics, okay? But we'll use ray and, and uh, wave optics to kind of build this up. We're going to talk about the Fourier transform mathematically. We'll apply it to diffraction from a slit, to predict diffraction from the slit. We'll talk about what we're going to do in lab this week, this week for optical filtering, and we'll apply it to images, which will be mainly qualitative type uh, topics. So the Fourier transform. So what's the Fourier transform? Well, if you recall, this is the Fourier transform, and it transforms a function in the time domain or the spatial domain, meaning a function as a function of time or a function of space or distance, into the frequency domain, which could be frequency or omega, which is 2 pi f, which is also frequency, and the inverse. And so you could go back and forth between the frequency domain and, the, in this case, it's the uh, spatial domain as a function of distance. So if you look at this, if you want to take a function which is a function of distance or space space here, you put the function in here, you take the integral with respect to x, because this is a function of space, so we're taking the integral with respect to space, and you put in here this term here, which makes it a Fourier transform, so I've got e to the minus i 2 pi f and x, okay? And you're wondering, well, how does this introduce frequencies? Well, the frequencies come in in terms of this e to the imaginary i x here, because if we use Euler's fam formula, you can see that these are equivalent to sines and cosines. And you could do the inverse as well, where you you say you derive the the function as, as a function of the frequency domain. You put it in here, and you reverse things, and essentially you can obtain it back into the spatial domain. And so, what what is this? physically look like. Well, here's an example. Let's say I have a square wave here, and I'm looking at that in terms of the spatial domain, and I want to know what in the frequency domain I have for that square wave. Well, I could approximate the square wave, which is the dotted line here, as the summation of all these different spatial frequencies for the square wave. So if you added this sine wave up with this sine wave up this sine wave, and you superimpose them and you look at their interference, you would end up with a, a resulting function that looks like this. And if I added more and more of these space, spatial frequencies, got finer and finer, eventually I could get it to the point where it looked almost straight. And so any function, including this square wave here, can be represented in terms of spatial frequencies. And this is important because you're probably still wondering how in the world when we did these holographic films did they create images like the keyboard, the eyeball, and text as light diffracted? How did they calculate that? Well, they used the Fourier transform to calculate these things. They didn't put dots on here one by one to build these things up and say, well, that's how I think it's going to work and it's going to work in the end. But rather they used mathematics to predict this. Now, any waveform image etc. can be expressed as a superposition of numerous harmonics, okay? And so not just a square wave, but even an image can be expressed. So here's a waveform, which I could express as a, as a combination of multiple harmonics. And here's an image that I could start to represent as a superposition of multiple harmonics interfering, okay? So I have to, of course, 
I'd have to go more than these to have an image of this resolution, but eventually if I had enough of these, I could reproduce the same image in terms of their interference. Now, this is important because when we talk about things like image compression, instead of mapping out every exact dot here, I can use these to approximate it, because this is a simple sign at an angle here with an amplitude and, amplitude and phase to it, which is, I mean, mainly with just the phase and the uh, frequency here. And so that's a lot less information than doing this bit by bit. We'll talk more about that later. So let's look at an example when we talked about those holographic cards about how I can use the Fourier transform to predict diffraction. And we'll do a simple case. We're not going to do those holographic films because that's far more complicated. But let's do the simplest example we can think of, which is a single slit example. So consider the irradiance pattern for a single slit diffraction pattern, which is the easiest function in terms of y of x we could probably do. And so here's my position y here, and my single slit has a width d, and here's the light coming through, and then I get diffraction, right? Well, what's my function y? Well, I know for I know y of x equals 0 when my value x is greater than d over 2. So if this is d, I'll say, I'll call this 0. This will be d over 2 in this direction, d over 2 in this direction. And once you go beyond that, my function y becomes 0 because no light can get through. And my function y of x here becomes a 1 when I am less than d over 2, meaning that less than d over 2 in this direction, basically within this aperture, from 0 to d over 2 and 0 to minus d over 2, I get a 1 because the light gets through. And so if my function is 0, I don't have to put that into this integral for the Fourier transform because the 0 in here makes the whole thing 0. So I just have to put the y of x equals 1 and the appropriate limits, which are minus d over 2 from this end, to plus d over 2, which gives me a total distance of d. I'll put that in there. I'll integrate, and I end up with the following function, okay? And so now this is taking something from the spatial domain, and it's transformed it to the frequency domain, and in this case, it's wave numbers. So we're looking at it in terms of k, which is related to frequency through wavelength, okay? So k is wave number 2 pi over wavelength, and wavelength, as we know, is related to the frequency as well. You can calculate it as well, okay? So I put this in terms of wave number, and here's the sync function. Well, this is the electric field max, maximum here as a function of position. We know that intensity is E field squared. So if I take this sync function and square it, and I plot the re resulting in function, which is intensity, watts per meter squared, you'll see that I get the solution for diffraction from a single slit as a function of angle. And here's again the, the center lobe and the, and the darker modes here. And so you can now see how you can use the Fourier transform to mathematically take a spatial domain and then see what happens in the frequency domain in terms of diffraction. And you can go a little bit more complicated. This is as far as, I'll, as complicated as I'll show you. Let's do a double slit, I mean a, a rectangular slit. And the only difference now is instead of just being in one direction having to do the Fourier transform, I have to do it in a 2D fashion because this has dimensions in both X and Y. And so I do the exact same thing, d over 2 minus d over 2. But instead of just doing dx, I do dx and dy to get my function. And if you do that, you'll basically be able to solve and mathematically even plot this diffraction pattern. Now, what does this have to do with optics? So let's figure out how we can do the Fourier transform with optics. That would be really cool because we could do that at the speed of light, right? So I could do Fourier transforms at the speed of light, no computing necessary. And imagine if I've got a really complicated object or something. I don't want to have to do all the calculation of all the Fourier transform for all the features of the object or image. Rather, I could just put it in this laser beam somehow, have that object shine on through this optical system, and have the optical system perform the Fourier transform. So that's why we're excited about this, okay? And so, in this experiment, we have a laser beam expander, and we've got parallel light rays here. And we know that for a lens here, all the light will therefore converge at the focal point here. So this is going to be what we call the Fourier plane, and this is the Fourier lens. So a Fourier lens is any positive lens. It's not a special lens. If, so, if, you go to, if you're going down the street and a guy says, hey, I want to sell you Fourier lenses, they're special lenses, you say, nope, they're just positive lenses. And the Fourier plane is the focal point of that lens, 
Okay. Now, a laser beam that's expanded like this is unchanging, right? It's light that's constant across here, and so there are no harmonic frequencies. There's nothing to, there's nothing to project because it's just a DC level, right? It's, I call it the DC component. And so it all collapses down to a spot here. If I looked in the Fourier plane, I'd see a spot, and I call that the DC component of this optical signal. Now, let's change that by putting some frequencies into this. In this case, I'm going to put an object here which is a mesh. So I'm going to put a mesh here. And we know that as light hits edges of things like a wire mesh, I get diffraction, right? So what's going to happen? Well, what happens to that diffracted light is it's no longer going to be parallel, right? So if I have diffraction here, I have light coming at these angles, at these angles. And so they're going to hit the lens at angles such that they no longer focus down to the focal point, and they'll give me dots. And so if I looked at a one-dimensional wire mesh. It's a bunch of lines in this direction, okay? And I looked in the Fourier plane, I would see dot, 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 central dot for DC, dot, dot, dot. I turn it on its side here, here's the DC portion, I call these dots that are from the diffraction here, those are the AC portion or the spatial frequencies of the object I put in this system, okay? And so again, I put a surface that has cha that's changing rapidly from transmissive to not transmissive, that gives me higher frequencies, and I can see it now in the Fourier plane, these small dots, which are the AC frequencies for this, this, this wire uh, mesh here. So, now let's filter things in the Fourier plane, and the cool thing about this is that we can do optical image filtering at the speed of light. No computation required. So let's say in this case, our object is a wire mesh. And here's our positive lens, and if I look in the Fourier plane, I will see the central DC component, which is the light which goes between the wires, which is the boring DC signal that collapses the focal point. And then I'll see dots in both directions, which is diffraction. Okay, And so if I have light coming through and diffracting off these portions of the light of the wires, like this part of the wire here, it's going to be diffracted in this direction, right? And so this will correspond, these dots will correspond with the horizontal wires. And if I look at diffraction off the vertical wires in the mesh, they're going to be diffracted in this direction. I'm looking at light, by the way, I'm looking at the light coming towards me here through this mesh, okay? And those will show up as dots on these sides, okay? Now, if I go past the Fourier plane, Back to this image plane, I will see the lens doing what I expect. It'll just invert the image, but it's a mesh, so there's no inversion, right? And so I see here the same mesh reappearing out here at the image plane. Now, let's take a look at filtering at this point. Now we add a vertical filter. And when you do this in the lab, your object will be the mesh placed right here for a lens. You'll put a vertical filter here such that only light through this slit here in the middle gets through. And when you look at the image plane, you will only see horizontal lines. Why is that? Well, like I explained here, okay, the horizontal lines are the ones that give diffraction in the vertical direction, so you let that component of the light through. The vertical lines in the, in the mesh to f cause diffraction to spread out the light in this way, these components you had blocked with this filter. And so now you can see how you've changed the amount, what type of information is getting through this, uh, through this optical Fourier filtering system. And you could do the same thing here with a horizontal filler, filter where the result is the vertical lines and you should be able to apply the same analogy and understand how that happened as well. I want to make one more note for this, is could we then use this to take a dirty laser beam and clean it up? And so if you have an optical system and I have mirrors and I have lenses and they've got dust and scratches, which is true for this lab because you guys abuse the optical components pretty good. And as a result, after I send it through these dirty lenses and mirrors with scratches on them, all of a sudden I got noise on my laser beam that it's no longer a high quality you know, um, um, parallel, all parallel laser beam. Could I use Fourier transform to clean that up? Well, yes, I could. Basically, all I would do is I would put a card here with a hole in the center, 
So it's just the DC component, which is the clean component of the laser, would get through, and all the dust and the scratches would basically cause diffractions and refractions, right? That would show up here out as higher frequencies, and those I could filter out by having a card, which again only passes the DC signal, and people use this all the time in optical systems where they need a really clean laser beam to get rid of all the higher harmonics on the laser beam and just get the clean DC signal back, even through a dirty optical system. So at this point, take a break and go through these review questions and we'll start up again when you're ready.